Hello, um, my name is Paul Gilbert, and this is part of the Creating a Compassionate World series of interviews. And I'm delighted today to be able to welcome Professor Darcia Nevez. So I'm going to just um, bring up my screen for you. So Darcia is an international authority on what she calls the Evolved Nest, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. She set up an organization, as you can see from the slide called the Evolved Nest. Do go and visit it because there's some terrific stuff there. And um, we share the idea that since agriculture, we've really had a problems in how we create learning and growing environments for our children and our communities. So she uh, has done some terrific publications as you can see, many publications associated with this idea about the early backgrounds we have and the context we create have a fundamental impact on the kinds of relationships we form with each other and particularly with morality. There we are, that's her new book. Her new book is called Restoring the Kinship Worldwide. And so without more ado, I'm now going to talk to Darcia. So Darcia, welcome and thank you so much for coming and spending some time to share your ideas with us and your research over many, many years. So can you tell us a little bit about what's your ideas about the evolved nest and how did you come to these ideas? Well, thanks so much, Paul, for having me. It's really an honor to be here and to have a, a voice on your important network of, of colleagues and associates and uh, to be talking with you, a leader in this area for so long. And I, uh, you know, I've, um, I've had multiple careers. Uh, so my PhD in moral development was really my seventh career uh, in that academia. Uh, I have spent a lot of time looking for truth and, and uh, developing other talents and interests. And I, really am rooted in my first uh, memories of living outside the United States and having ex experiences of seeing children my age uh, on the street corner selling gum in rags, you know, and, and then coming back to this United States every uh, year, a couple years uh, at home and then a year abroad. Yeah. And seeing the overwhelming materialism and overabundance and waste, uh, hundreds types of cereal, you know, in the cereal aisle of the grocery store. And it was just, yeah. uh, I couldn't yeah. understand the uh, injustices of the world. Now, it took me then uh, some careers to get back to the focus <clears throat> on children. And that's where I am now, uh, is how important that early life experience is for shaping the neurobiology, how our personalities, our capacities to get along with others. And that's what the Evolved Nest is about. <clears throat> my um, my uh, discovery uh, after graduate school that uh, attachment, which we uh, read about, heard about uh, in, in my studies, you know, it was always about working models, internal working models. And I discovered later from the work of James Prescott, Yak Peng Sept, Alan Shore, that these things are really neurobiological that you're being engraved on by your experience in early life. And I had been studying moral, moral reasoning, moral development, morality from the kind of top down uh, area, intellect, you know, the Western world thinks that intellect is the what drives moral um, behavior, you reason and you act on the reason you have have to have a strong will. And I discovered, no, it's, got, it's bottom up. I mean, there's some top down things, of course, too, but it's bottom up. How capable are you in the moment of being attuned to the other person? How capable are you of being empathic and compassionate and tuned into, uh, you know, creating an interpersonal reality right then? And what we've done in the Western world, in particular, the dominant culture is we've kind of undermine the development of those capacities that really our ancestors uh, found to be successful and brought us here, we're all here because of the intense social capacities of our ancestors. And we've been undermining those. Uh, and the Evolved Nest is about restoring those capacities. So the Evolved Nest is, includes soothing perinatal experiences, breastfeeding extensively and on request, moving touch, 
uh, and no negative touch, no corporal punishment, a welcoming climate of uh, uh, receptive, loving care, self-directed play with multiple others, uh, responsive uh, care, which includes from mother, but also others, allo mothers or other nurturers, uh, the um, <clears throat> nature connection, uh, which is this deep um, sense of ecological attachment to the natural world so that it's part of your partnership, your web of uh, your network of relationships. And then healing practices, routinely healing and letting go of resentments and imbalance and getting back in tune in those relationships. These are the things we see happen all over the world in traditional societies that in the dominant culture have been abandoned pretty much and undermined in various ways. So, Yeah, that's such an important message, isn't it? Because, you know, you're very interested in hunter-gatherer societies, which were pre-agriculture and in hunter-gatherer societies, as you've written, the, your survival really depended upon the good relationships you had with your group. And children in those societies were, uh, were able to go to anyone in the community for support and caring. And the whole idea was to create an environment of sharing and caring and social support. That's what actually supported your, um, your survival. And we now know that actually issues such as play was very, very important in these communities, the sharing of positive emotion. And then came agriculture, and unfortunately, then things started to go downhill quite seriously. And uh, as you say, now, you know, many mothers are really bereft of a, of a supportive environment to bring their children. So these are really key themes, aren't they? That, and as you say, that actually this environment of being safe, connected, cared for, a lot of affectionate touch, all the things that you talk about are fundamental for the maturation of the brain and what happens to our epigenetics. Epigenetics are even affected by that. So, I mean, what do you think we could do to actually try to move us back into trying to create environments that support our pro-sociality rather than our intense competitiveness, which is what neoliberalism tends to do? So we're kind of stuck in this cycle of uh, what I call the cycle of competitive detachment, where yeah. we under care for the young, and then we, uh, the, who end up with kind of dysregulation and uh, lack or underdevelopment of the social skills, the moral morality of compassion, uh, and then they become adults who are not very well, and they're not very, their, their morality is all about me, protectionism, you know, and, and uh, hierarchical dominance, uh, and that's, the, you know, us against them, all that. And then those adults create culture then that undermine the meeting of basic needs, because that's what they're used to. So it's a slip, slippage in baselines on all those levels. You've, we've under, we've forgot what children need, and, and we think it's fine to minimize the needs of babies and just get them through that period. So uh, they'll be regular people after what, you know, after they get through this very needy time. And then we think it's normal for kids to be aggressive and self-centered and that adults too are, you know, self-interest. Yeah, that's normal human behavior. And we think it's normal to have cultures where it's all about competition and detachment from relationships, but that's not normal for our species. We just got all the baselines wrong. And that's, you know, part of the, the history, recent history of um, the dominating cultures, colonization and capitalism and globalization, all that has shifted us in what we think is normal. And so to get back to what I call the, the cycle of connected, cooperative companionship, we need to then provide the evolved nest for the young. So that means that intensive care of the community uh, it's not just moms, it's not just moms and dads, it's the whole community of support in those uh, different components I mentioned. That will then foster our species typical nature of getting along well and everything functioning well, all our immune system, the endocrine system, our vagus nerve, all that stuff is affected by the, the nest, right? And then the adults are going to have well-being instead of being sickly and addicted and, and distracted, they're gonna develop wisdom. And then they're gonna keep the cycle going by providing for basic needs. And that's what we find in hunter-gatherer communities all over the world. It's about sharing, it's about always being generous and, and connected. 
And that's the, the um, important thing about being a human being is being heart-minded, which is a kind of um, holistic, balanced, uh, relational attunement. And um, that involves uh, paying attention to the web of life and how you're acting in every moment and the manner you're acting and, and what you have in mind. Uh, and it becomes an effortless kind of orientation to helping and being with others, uh, which uh, Chinese would say that is Wu Wei. And we've lost that. We made it so hard to be socially attuned because we didn't develop all those micro skills in early childhood. And so it takes adults now uh, in raised in the competitive culture, oh, it's so much work to be good, <laughs> right? Because it's not all those layers of development were undermined or missed or underdeveloped. So we need to get back to the, the cycle that actually helps us thrive, that helps us flourish, helps the, the planet flourish as well. And we, we're seeing the results of our recent um, kind of undercare uh, just going all over the planet now, uh, just the destructiveness. Uh, because you, you don't develop a true sense of self, you're, you shut it down because you were not mutually recognized as a baby, as a being of beauty and, and uh, a loving in a loving nest. Then you have to develop all these <clears throat> um, uh, false selves uh, and you protect your false self, you know, white supremacy, right? Or, you know, what gun culture in the States, uh, that's what it means to be a person. And don't you come after, you know, my belief there because that's who I am, but it's a false self and you have to keep building it up or else because there's nothing there really because you're not in tune with your true self. Yes, I think that's terrific. I mean, one of the things I love about what you say is this highlighting the fact that we have created deeply, deeply abnormal environments. And they are, you know, our, as you know, I read a book called Living Like Crazy. They, we are literally driving ourselves nuts. Um, and it's, you know, if we look at history since agriculture with the formation of large groups and hierarchies, I mean, we have been absolutely vicious. I mean, you can think about all our wars and holocausts and the Roman gladiatorial games, the, the torches, the crucifixions, the slavery and so on. We're, we're quite nuts, actually. And I think the work that you do is to kind of show why that is. We are so far off of what you, you call the evolved nest that the, our brains are simply not developing in the way in which they are really evolved to develop as a caring, sharing species. And so, you know, I think, I think that's a key message to get across that although people think this is a nice environment because we've got medicine and all the comforts of modern the world but psychologically it's a very abnormal environment and the, the work that you're doing makes that so clear I think the, the, the question is though how can we help people see this and it's quite important in mental health as well because people often blame themselves for being depressed or being anxious or whatever it is but the rates of depression are so high we have to help people understand look it's not your fault you're actually living in a depressive culture, you're living in an aggressive culture. Um, that's why you're experiencing this. So your message has a lot of uh, things to say to people who have mental health problems. So what do you see as ways in which we can move forward, do you think? What do we need to do? There's uh, multiple levels to alter. Uh, part of the problem is the systems that we're in are oriented to maintaining. The yeah. Ill, <laughs> illness producing system, a trauma inducing system. Mm. And we need to move back and understand what, what, we, what I'm calling now the wellness informed pathway. The wellness informed pathway is the evolved nest fostering uh, thriving. And then that's fostering a heart mindedness and uh, just the capacities to be together. And then that is linked to an earth centered way of living, which is the indigenous lifestyle. Now the indigenous perspective has been degraded and uh, for so long and assumed to be, you know, primitive and all this stuff, but it isn't. It's, uh, you know, and people tend to glom things together in the past and just say it's all, it was all bad and we're on, or things are so much better, but that's because they're, they're misdirecting our attention. So people like Steven Pinker, for example, says, oh, we're so much better now. Uh, but he 
he's uh, taking all sorts of hierarchical uh, societies. You have to distinguish what kind of society you're talking about and lumping them together with hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers are, <clears throat> are different. Small band hunter-gatherers, nomadic foragers, don't have, didn't, don't, they still exist, don't have possessions. They don't uh, worry about tomorrow so much as just immediately um, uh, use what food and, and such they find and, and uh, hunt and such. And they're very oriented to relational uh, attunement and enjoyment of life. Now this sounds like very hippie stuff, right? Uh, but what they provide then is the nest, it's the evolved nest. And they, you can see how much smarter they are in various ways and how much more flexible and attuned they are to the natural world and receptively intelligent and all. So my argument is that we need to take that nesting and bring it in then into our uh, more modern way of, of, of living and then uh, you know, integrate the well-developed de well children and human beings who are then gonna change those systems that are illness and trauma inducing to wellness promoting systems instead. So we have to understand that, you know, it's uh, to, we need to embrace our evolved uh, selves. Now, part of what's happened is in the Western world, there's a fear of our animal nature. Oh no, we're gonna be out of control. And you know, it's Hobbes, Hobbesian world and the id. But that's all misunderstanding. That's, you're looking at babies, young children that have been unnested. And then they look out of control and dysregulated. So we're, our baselines again are all kind of messed up. We think that it's normal for the aggressive selfishness uh, and you have to control that with all sorts of things, right? But that's not true when you provide the nest. So we have to recalibrate our baselines. We have to then work at multiple levels wherever we are. There are things you can do. And that is, you know, first to get yourself lined up, to calm yourself, because all of us probably have some dysregulation of some sort. We have to pay attention to when we start to get angry or, or withdraw and try to work through whatever that is, what are, those triggers are, and learn self-calming techniques like belly breathing, humming, um, uh, you know, things that help that vagus nerve uh, recalibrate so that we can actually be present emotionally and be connected to others. But that's not enough either. If we were to spend our babyhood in a crib alone or a playpen, we didn't develop all that social skills to get along with others. And so it feels awkward or, you know, just it's more uh, pleasurable to be alone than to be with others. We have to develop social joy then. In my classes with undergraduate students, I, we would learn folk song games. So hunting we will go, hunting we will go, we'll catch a little fox and put him in a box and then we'll let him go. And when you play games like that, you have to look people in the eye, you have to touch them and you're moving around in play and it it's, grows your right brain. Your right hemisphere grows throughout life, but you have to do stuff in the present moment. And then it's, it's growing social capacities, your empathy, your ability to reach higher consciousness, all that stuff in the right hemisphere. And so you need to build those skills as well. And then you need to also expand your imagination beyond these limited ideas of who we are as a human species. We are good. We, like all animals, are here to enjoy life together in you know, mutuality uh, and get back to that kind of orientation um, in order for us to be able to thrive together. Yes, that's terrific. So, I mean, what you're doing is a series of steps, right? So, you, you know, firstly, you know, as you know, I would say, firstly, we have to recognize that some of our distress is not our fault. You know, we just found ourselves here in the midst of this madness, really, and uh, trying to make sense of it. So then you say, OK, so look, if you begin to do these things to become aware that maybe your mind isn't working in the way that it was biologically designed, what it was biologically designed to was to take joy from social interactions and to feel supported and cared by others. And that would be the source of play and fun and meaning for you. So the first thing, as you say, is to begin to understand your own mind and begin to work with your own mind and begin to work with your own emotions and so on. And then 
how that you can set that into a community, start thinking about how you can be with your community and make contributions to your community. I mean, one of the things of COVID, I suppose, was that people discovered that actually, you know, when they had opportunities to be contributors, they all came out. I mean, there was, there was a huge outpouring of people who wanted to be helpful to others. So it's there, it's just how to release it. And, uh, and bringing this into the schools, I think what you, you know, we have a compassion program in schools and this idea of joyful play, I think is a very important concept that you talk about because it changes your right brain. It gives you, um, it gives you excitement, doesn't it really? That's right. It, it makes life worthwhile, right? I mean, why should we be so miserable? We think misery is normal. <laughs> it's not normal. Uh, you know, we have the high suicide rates and high uh, addiction rates to, to show that people are pretty miserable. Yeah. Uh, and so we want to have a message of hope that we don't have to be this way, that we can break out of this system that's uh, keeping us down, that's benefiting the 1% at the top. They want to keep the system going. So they give us lots of misinformation about, oh, this is the way it has to be. You know, there's no, this is just the collateral damage of progress, you know, and all the, these myths <laughs> about how to be a human being and what it means to, to be successful or to be, uh, to have a good life. That's right. That's right. I mean, I think, and we were just talking to a colleague, a client actually, uh, about the drive to be wealthy. Why do you want to be wealthy? Well, um, because then I won't have to worry. I won't have to worry about food. I won't have to worry about health care, you know, because I can buy it all. And that's the society we've got. You know, I don't have to worry if I can buy it all, right? And But you say to them, well, but what, what do you really want? And of course, what people really want is they want to be happy. They don't want to suffer. That's what they really want. And then you say, well, okay, but Supposing you had all this wealth and you lived in a desert island, which is you, there wasn't anybody else, would you be happy? Well, no, because relationships are the source of happiness, connectedness, feeling part of and so on. So helping people realize that a lot of the way, reasons we pursue wealth is, yes, we get a buzz from it, a bit of a dopamine, isn't that great? But also it's because we feel very frightened underneath that if we don't have this wealth, then we can have all kinds of stresses that we can't resolve. But the hunter-gatherer situation is to say, don't worry, we'll be there for you. We'll be there for you. Uh, and it's that ability to create a sense of social trust so that you don't need to kind of just achieve and be better than everybody else and have more than everybody else. Your, your happiness is much more linked into the quality of the relationships you have with people because they're the ones that will really stimulate your oxytocin and the Vegas note. So I think a lot of the stuff that you're talking about really speaks to that message Yes, it's good to have wealth and so on. Of course it is. But actually, happiness is in relationships. And uh, that's why your Evolved Nest is such an important concept because right from the day you're born, you know. And so we have to remember uh, that we are relational beings. And I think our culture in the Western world in particular emphasizes the individualism, all sorts of myths about that, right? That we are yeah. a basic unit of, of societies, the individual. No, that's not what the global South would say. The traditional society would say, no, it's I am because you are Ubuntu, right? Uh, there's no me without you. Uh, and we've we've just separated, you know, children. You put them in a, you make them sleep alone. You leave them alone to cry. They build that one person psychology, that individualism. And they think that's normal. They also build a sense of scarcity they're not breastfed on request, for example. They're not carried around in the community all day long and all night. Uh, and so they, they feel like there's something missing always, right? And they carry that forward into their life, that there's never enough. There's never enough because the period for fulfilling those needs, like breastfeeding, passed. And so you, you can't fulfill it uh, when you're 35, right? So uh, we create these gaps in people's brains and their psyches and then they they kind of get stuck in that need right they can't quite get it fulfilled and they keep looking and looking and looking so it's really important to get back to understanding who we are as human beings what is a human being we're social mammals we have uh evolved um with practices well are, we inherit much more than genes. It's not just genes. That's just one little tiny thing. In fact, it's not that important compared to some other things like epigenetics. 
And we inherited the developmental system for the young, which we call the evolved nest, to epigenetically shape how those genes are expressed. We inherit the culture. We inherit the ecology of our mother's bodies, of the, the world around us. We inherit cell and body plans, which are not genetically uh, transmitted. All sorts of things we inherit. Why are we focused on genes? Well, that's because it was very convenient for capitalism and imperialism and colonization to say some people are better than others. And, and you know, this competition is good. And uh, these people who are better than others with uh, better competition or whatever are the ones who should control the world. And so we're still stuck in that story. Um, and we have to remember that in a way that story has led to the demise of the planet all right that something's uh, that domination is more important than partnership for example uh, and so we really need to attend to the global south and traditional societies indigenous wisdom the people who have been around for thousands of years tens of thousands of years the san bushman have been around for at least 100,000 150,000 years they know how to live well, they, and they're happy, and, and they spend uh, a lot of time just being uh, together, and they don't, you know, uh, there's all sorts of things to say about them, but um, we have much to learn from them uh, if we're going to survive as a species, and I think we have to actually move, move along quickly <laughs> and learn some of those things before it's too late. Yes, very much so, and um, I suppose one of the things that's sometimes said about this is that you know Robin Dunbar's wonderful work on the 150 this the small group that's a basically that's the size we kind of evolved in and problems come when we live in mega groups these huge groups of strangers and it's really about then how we can take the psychology that was really designed for small groups where you'd know everybody from the day you live to the day you die into actually in these mega groups where it was surrounded by lots of people you don't know strangers and so on so i think that's a really interesting challenge and uh, i wonder if you had any thoughts about that new book out by david graber the late david graber and david wengro called the dawn of everything and they argue and they have uh, some articles too that have pointed this out that our evolution of societal sociopolitical um, organization wasn't linear in the way that we think, you know, that hunter gatherers came first and then came, you know, chiefdoms and came uh, states and such. They say, no, the evidence, are, and David Wengrow is an archeologist, the evidence shows that part of the year, they might, they might be in, uh, in, some groups were in hunter gatherer communities that were very egalitarian. And then the other part of the year, they're in this hierarchical, very big, grouped um, uh, thousands of people living together uh, where hierarchy was necessary, uh, but then they moved back into the hunter-gatherers. So it depended on the time of year, what they were doing, you know, um, in terms of uh, natural resources and such. So I think that helps us to understand that it's not linear. Life is not a linear thing. Uh, and we can, we're more flexible than we let ourselves believe. Yeah, that's interesting. I'd heard about that. I mean, I have to be honest, I haven't caught up with it yet, but I was very excited to I think I read it in the New Scientist or something. So I was going to go and get that book and have a read, it, read of it. Because that is that is a quite a new way of thinking, isn't it? I don't think that we appreciated that until they started to talk about that. And I think they've done some work in Britain, actually, with, around the Stonehenge. And, so, yeah. yeah, so that's that's quite extraordinary, isn't it, really? Uh, what you're saying there. Um, Another uh, myth is that um, we have, our genes have led us to what we are. We've evolved further, but we, we still are mammals. We're still social mammals. We have not moved away from being social mammals and social mammals have certain needs to build, to grow well. And we know that if you separate a, a puppy or a kitten from its mother too soon, you've kind of wrecked their personality, right? You've made them neurotic uh, or, and they'll have health problems and various, but we kind of do these experiments on babies all the time. We separate them from the mother and send them off to strangers. And we somehow think that's okay. 
because of this bias towards genes, you know, oh, it's genetic, or kids are resilient. Uh, and we kind of don't understand that the illness and ill being among adults that we see now so widespread in the USA uh, is due in part to the mistreatment of the children, of the babies, of the birth of the mother when, when she was pregnant with that baby. Uh, she needs to be calm. The birth needs to be is soothing and not uh, no painful procedures, no circumcision, no separation of mom and baby. You know, and then all that, you know, that loving environment, the continuum of, of love and life connection needs to be throughout life. We break, break, break. We cut off connection all the time for young children. And then we think uh, it's their problem, <laughs> whatever, whatever uh, uh, symptoms they show, right? So we have to remember that we are responsible as adults even if we were not raised well, we have responsibility to come forward and heal ourselves and then provide that loving nesting uh, experience for our young. And I think the other point that you make in, in, in your work is that it's not just the baby, it's actually the context in which the mother grows. I mean, when we had our daughter, which is 40 years ago now, Actually, um, when I went to work, my wife was on her own in the house, right? Because we we weren't in the town of our family. We'd moved away for work and all the rest of it. So very socially isolated, actually. And the lack of support for mothers and to some degree fathers is a very serious problem. I mean, you know, mothers are carrying this huge burden of childcare, often by themselves or with very limited support. And that, I think, is a major issue. And it also means that those infants don't have other individuals who will support them and calm them and, and soothe them if the mother is you know, tired or something like that. Um, so everything sort of is located on this one person, which is, is again, as you say, grossly abnormal. So you know, we need to think about it as the dyad, the, the mother-baby relationship is, is it, it contextualized in a hostile environment in the West, I think. Absolutely. And there's evidence that shows that that baby then that's just has the mother to react to is not going to be as flexible and uh, be able to adjust to multiple types of relationships. And then they can be very rigid, right, in what kind of relationship or expectations they have for relationships, more conservative in that sense. Uh, and they are um, oriented maybe to having their own way, or Morris Berman talks about this, this uh, transcendental um, relation to God, you know, that it's, you want it like that mother that you had. Whereas in our hunter-gatherer context, our ancestral context, you're related, to, you, you feel attached to lots of people, not just the one person, right? Uh, and so there seems to be some danger of just having that one, one attachment. It needs to be expanded. And it also needs to include attachment to the natural world so that you feel at home on the earth. You don't feel alienated or that, you know, the, the nature is out to get me. That's uh, abnormal for our species and for any species, actually. Uh, we're more like zoo animals. <laughs> we've been isolated in cages and then, oh, don't let me out there. Ah. <laughs> so we have to get back, back to being uh, earth-centered. Earth creatures, we're part of the earth. And even when we die, we're part of the earth. We're going to make part of the next generation. So don't worry about it so much. You'll be here. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, these are very these very important things. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm just because I again, what my experience when we had our children, they'd get to um, you know um, perinatal classes and that sort of thing. But when the baby arrived, that was it. There was no real effort to say, okay you have to stay as a community for the next two, four years, right? As a community of women who are having babies or families who are having babies, stay connected and so forth. So I think, you know, again, what comes out of your work is that we need to do a lot more work in the post-birth period with the, with the nurses and so forth to create caring communities, that the keeping the mothers together, supporting them in working together and visiting each other and so on. Okay, look, we're coming to the end of what's been a fascinating discussion, but I want to ask you, so what are you doing now? I mean, how are you hoping to move forward with your, with your work? We've been uh, publishing empirical articles on how the vagus nerve is affected by the nest experience. 
Uh, so that'll continue. I have a grad student who's uh, skilled in analyzing and uh, doing that kind of work. And I also am working on various parenting uh, books. Uh, I have a, a book called Nested Mother, Nested Baby, and we're looking for an artist uh, for that. Um, just a little kind of meditation kind of book. And uh, various uh, projects uh, trying to enhance or explain to people the indigenous worldviews, which is also the kinship worldview. So it's this orientation to relationships uh, with other people, but also with the natural world and a sense of humility and groundedness and uh, not being so ego inflated as uh, the Western or dominant culture wants us to be <laughs> or teaches us to be, to be much more uh, egalitarian towards everything. Um, and it's a much happier life uh, that you end up with as a result, because you know you're part of the whole. You're not isolated, you're not alone, you're never alone. Uh, there's always um, sentience all around you. So that's the, the perspective that most societies have had for most of human existence. It's just the Western enlightenment perspective that's told us now it's all in your head and that's the only important part, <laughs> which is then divorce from heart, divorce from a well-educated uh, gut reaction. So uh, getting back into kind of being um, a coordinated, uh, heart-minded and um, relational person. I'm working on various manuscripts and ways to convey that information. So the Evolved Nest has podcasts and videos and S log, uh, essays, and we have a curriculum we're working on for uh, homeschool, for high school level of how to learn about the nest. Um, and uh, oh, we also have 28 days um, projects. So for uh, 28 days of self calming. So each day there's a suggestion to do this during the day and as a practice for self calming, like belly breathing or various things, humming, singing. Uh, and then 28 days of baby care for helping mothers pay attention to their babies uh, more clearly and 28 days of play, um, social play, solo play, those are coming out. So we're trying to have different tools for different, um, different aspects of how to live a good life as a human being on the earth. Absolutely, thank you so much. I think, you know, that's, so you've given a very clear message that, you know, look, we're living in a very abnormal world. That's why we've got the mess that we are and our brains are all over the place because of what we've created with post agriculture. But if we see this and we don't blame ourselves for it, we then start to choose to work with ourselves first and then work with our communities and then really begin to understand what our social needs are, what it is that genuinely creates happiness and health. Then we can, we're on the way. And you are one of the great contributors to understanding what that is, where we need to go, and the journey that we need to take. So, Tarsia, thank you so much. Um, awesome. So, you. so, you've heard it from Garcia, Professor Darcia Navas from the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, and uh, put a slide up after the talk, and you can go and visit her website, terrific website. It's called EvolveNest.org, with a capital N, capital E, EvolveNest.org, and um, once again, Darcia, thank you very much for coming to talk to us today. You're welcome. And, and see our movie, BreakingTheCyclefilm.org. Yes. So I put that up on the, on the um, PowerPoint. That's right. BreakingTheCyclefilm.org. Uh, so you'll see that. Thank you. Thank you so much.